morning. Good morning. We've got some new friends back with us today. Look, good to see Andrew able to be back with us today. Uh, but uh, we're ready to begin here at, with uh, Sunday morning Bible class. Um, I know that uh, uh, there's many to pray for. Uh, Margaret is in room 115 still right here at the West Side Campus of Care. I am sure she'd love as many visits as she can get. Uh, and she's just across the parking lot. So uh, feel free to drop in on her. Uh, glad to report that Dwight is much better. It's just another manifestation of the ongoing problems he's had that he spent uh, Sunday and Monday evenings in the hospital. Just, uh, he's frustrated. He's saying, just take me home and put me in my chair. I'll have my whatever it is there. <coughs> Excuse me. And they, but they did some testing and saw that they, Welcome back from basic. <laughs> it's good to, I'm sure you're glad that's over. Yes. <laughs> Amen. 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 Well, Amen. Let, we'll begin in uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 6 in just a moment. But let's begin in prayer, shall we? Our Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us together today. And thank you for this tremendous passage about our lives each day. Help us to not only listen to it and hear it, but help us to begin to live it better, help us to grow closer to you, and help us to be more like your son. Thank you for your grace that we need every day, and help us to become more and more like your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm enjoying preaching through Romans. We'll do that next week with Romans chapter 8, beginning about verse 9. But I'm intentionally ahead of that. We're going to finish our discussions of the book of Romans in Bible class uh, before June begins. So we're here in one of my favorite chapters, and I have paused for an extra week here on Romans chapter 12. So we're ready to begin in chapter 12, verse 6. And to stay on schedule, it's okay if we don't stay on schedule. But if to stay on schedule, we'll need to complete, the, complete this chapter. Uh, I just don't want to, this chapter, and I believe chapter 16, are two of the richest chapters in the book of Romans. There is, and of course I love history, as you know, and there are so many names, so many churches named, and so many stories that are attached to them. And sometimes just the little short pithy statements in chapter 16 are so meaningful. Um, I had Hugo McCord as my Romans teacher. And uh, uh, he brought that to life so much for me. And I'll try to do some of the same for you. We're here in chapter, six, chapter 12, verse 6. But before we begin reading, I want you to start talking. So here's your talking question. What kind of gizmo is around your house, just gathering dust. You bought it, it looks so so awesome, and you're not using it. You're not, I'm not the only one with these gizmos, with these gadgets, with these uh, appliances or tools maybe out in the shed. Uh, is there something that you bought and it just isn't what it's supposed to be maybe, or just maybe it's awesome, but you just don't use it. Bread machine. Oh, yeah, I used that about 20 pounds worth. I can't keep using a bread machine anymore. That's a great one. Yes. Lawnmower. Lawnmower. I wish I didn't need my lawnmower. Man, I'd like for that. Now, I, I have to admit that I do have one extra lawnmower for no real reason. Yes. Vacuum cleaner. I do believe those should be... Uh, just uh, set aside, but how many have an extra vacuum cleaner besides the one you actually use? Yeah, two of them at Poco. You got two of them at Poco. Okay, vacuum cleaners. Anybody remember the Pocket Fisherman? Anybody own one of those? I never did. I wanted one so bad. Yes. A blender. Yeah. Does anybody have a blender? And when's the last time? Who has used a blender this week? John has. John has. You make a smoothie every now and then, don't you? 
you have a smoothie machine for the smoothies. If I had a smoothie machine, it would be the one gathering dust. Yeah? Yes, Chris. A DVD player. Yeah, I, I stream everything. Now I don't need the DVD player anymore. There's, there's so many gadgets, so many things that are just... What, what Chris? Yes. CDs. 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 Well, you went on to MP3s and MP4s a long time ago, didn't you, Chris? Yeah, Chris, you... Now, I still got CDs, and they are gathering dust as we speak right now, along with uh, at least... At least I've gotten out of the VHS age and gotten rid of those. So uh, those are making a comeback. They are some. They are making a comeback. What's really making a comeback is vinyl records. I I knew I was doing right to hang on to those scratchy old things I tore up as a teenager. Uh, I can't stand to play them uh, because of how I treated them. But you know, I could. I can, and maybe I will. What use is a gadget? like that. What use is a Pope Hill pocket fisherman or uh, if the salad master you never use anymore? What, what use are those? Yes, Chris? When the kids start all the work around, you can get the play ball on, they still wall. You can use the record albums for wall art, can't you? And they actually sell frames that are the right size. You may as well uh, because I'm not playing them. So uh, it brings back fond memories just like the music did. Well, we're going to talk about gifts today. And sadly, the worst thing about gifts are gifts we never use. Begin our reading in chapter, six, verse, chapter 12, verse 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If one's gift is prophecy... Let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encouraging. If it is giving, let him give generously. If it is leading, let him lead with diligence. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. This is... Somewhat of a parallel passage, or at least a similar figure of speech is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But let me contend to you, this is the one we want. This is the one that you and I want to talk about much more. Although there are very important Bible points to be gleaned from, Roman, from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But this one hits me right between the eyes. Question number one. How many gifts are there? Named. In this passage, not how many gifts there are in total. Well, let's let's count. Prophecy, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading, showing mercy. How many did you count? How many was that? Seven. Seven. Ever heard that number before? No. Has anybody seen that number in the Bible before? No. Besides there being seven days a week, uh, as God set up the system, right? And God rested his seventh day. We've got seven days there, but what book do you see sevens in over and over and over again? Revelation. The Revelation. The Revelation. The number ten. The number seven. Is Paul intending here to give you a definitive list of this is all there is? No, he's just telling you that you have it complete. You are fully equipped. These are all of God's gifts. A complete number. And whatever God's gifts have given you, God has given out gifts. Now let me ask you this question. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is talking about tongues and prophecy and uh all kinds of miraculous things that they are abusing in the church in Corinth. How many of these are necessarily miraculous? We had, what's the list? You've actually got a Bible in front of you, don't you? Gifts that differ. Prophecy, ministry, teaching, the exhortation, giving, 
leading mercy. And maybe we could go on to the next verse and say, let love be without hypocrisy. We might end up with eight there. But if we're using the usual seven, are they, are any of them necessarily miraculous? Prophecy. prophecy. What makes something a prophecy? What is the characteristic phrase of all Old Testament prophecy? Some predicts what happens in the future, and we have, we have made the term prophecy limited to the idea of predicting the future. And that is one aspect of biblical prophecy, but that was not Nathan's job whenever he came to see David. And there's one more. Thus saith the Lord. That's what I'm looking for. Thus saith the Lord. Do you have to have inspiration to say, thus saith the Lord? If you are giving in new information, it better be, thus saith the Lord, by inspiration in the, in the test, New Testament, in that era. And yet, can someone still say, thus saith the Lord today, and give the exhortation? Can you predict some future that has been predicted in the scriptures with a thus saith the Lord. You better be careful. But I'm contending that this is the passage we want to look at when we're talking about my gifts now. What am I supposed to do with my gifts? They're not necessarily miraculous in this chapter. If any are necessarily miraculous, it depends on the way you're looking at prophecy. And certainly, however, God, can in, God could be... Uh, giving some miraculous gifts, I suppose, or special endowment for leadership and teaching, and certainly teaching if it would, be, uh, would need to be inspired for those without any scriptures, but how many people have no scriptures? I mean, here, they've now got the book of Romans. It's in their hands. It's one of the first, but not necessarily the first. They've got every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in the heavenly places, right? The, the Ephesian brethren were told that in chapter 1, verse 3. No question. But these, this chapter is where we want to go right now to say, what's my gift? Because you've got a gift. What am I supposed to do with my gift? I think that is about the clearest statement that we can get. Joe, say it really loud. Use it. Can we all say that? One, two, three. Use, use it. it. Let's use it. use it. I mean, any of the prophets, some of these need a little further explanation, but most of them, it's, if it's teaching, then teach. Yeah. If it's giving, well, be generous with it. Yeah. Whatever the gift is, get out there and use it. Uh, we struggle sometimes with what is my gift. What specific instructions are given to some of the gifts? Which gifts have specific instructions? Verse 8. He who gives, how is he supposed to give? Liberally. So don't be stingy. You may have the gift of giving and you might be given a million dollars, but that doesn't mean you give everybody a quarter. Do what God wants you to do with it. How about leading? Are those who lead, lead with laziness? Are some want, looking for a title and prestige rather than a job? But what did Paul say? He who, off, who desires the office of a bishop desires a good work. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Paul's very clear. It's a work. It's something we're doing. And of course, fulfill your service, your ministry, Paul reminded Timothy. Whatever it is we do, leadership needs to be done with diligence. And if you show mercy, why is that? What's the exhortation for those who show mercy? If you show mercy, do it with with a scowl. 
How dare you do that? Yeah, you can come back to church. But I'm, we're, we're going to be watching you, brother. We're going to watch what you did. Is that the way we show mercy? What's the text say? With cheerfulness. Who's the example of cheerfulness and not cheerfulness in Luke chapter 15 in the, pro, in the, the parable of the prodigal son and the elder brother? Who's giving out the cheerful mercy? The father. And the woman who swept her house. And the shepherd. And the angels. God rejoices over his opportunity to extend cheerfulness, with it, with, to extend mercy. And yet, sometimes we're saying, how come they had more fun than me? And we have the elder brother attitude. Love must be sincere. Verse 9. Detest what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Outdo yourselves in honoring one another. Do not let your zeal subside. Keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord. I'm going to not go to the next slide right now. I'm just going to ask you those questions. Keep the text in your, in your, in your mind right here. For question number one. What hatred is commanded? Evil. Those evil people. I hate Nazis. I hate communists. Is that right? Not the people. Hate evil. Hate sin. Hate the garment soiled by sin, as Jude describes it. God hates sin, and so must we. What do we glue ourselves to? That's the literal meaning of this word cling. Glue yourself to the good. Well, we don't do good as a, a matter of, wow, that'll be a good idea. Let me do that just this one time. You've got to glue yourself to the good. Philippians 4 8. Meditate on these things, on the good, the, on whatsoever things are lovely, just, of good report, if there's virtue, if there's praise. Think on these things. How should we compete? How should we outdo one another? How are you showing honor? Who can come up with the best compliment? Who can find the best way to honor another person? Who can find the best way to make somebody feel good about themselves? Do you, do you practice that? Have you ever seen how much mileage you can get out of a good compliment? Uh, Willard Tate would say, I could live on a good compliment for two weeks. Just no problem. I don't need to eat or drink. I had that compliment. I'm ready to go. Me too. I love a good compliment. Chris, yes. God loves me? God loves me? I ought to be able to go forever on that one. That's absolutely <coughs> right. Yes, God loves us. I am a soul worthy of Forgiveness. If only I will submit to God. How compatible is this idea of be devoted to one another in brotherly love, verse 10, and the idea, I love you. I don't have to like you. I, I will be kind to your face and I will treat you well because you are my brother or sister in Christ, but you just annoy me to death. You're driving me crazy. Don't get me wrong, brothers and sisters, sometimes will drive you crazy. So does your brother or sister in the flesh. Sometimes, to be honest, your spouse is going to drive you nuts too, right? Not me. Now, this is everything is roses and perfect. Don't you go to Glenda and say she's getting on my nerves. She's not. But every human interaction has some friction to it. What is 
this love. Is this for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son love? That's the word agape, right? And we are commanded to have that love. But the translator makes sure you know this isn't that word. Be devoted to one another in phileo. I don't like what somebody does, but I respect them. You do respect them, and you have respect for everybody in the whole world. But this relationship is not the relationship to the sinner. This is to one another. Am I expected to build a companionship, a friendship, a mutual relationship with every Christian I can? Or am I allowed to choose and pick and say, I want to be a part of this clique, and I really don't like those folks on that side of the auditorium? Chris, I can't hear you yet. Just say. Yes, we have to do unto others as we have them do unto us. Matthew chapter 7 is, is very clear about that. We've got to live by the golden rule, and that's for everybody. But how about Christians? Isn't there anything more? Yes. And we're going to get to that in this chapter, talking about repaying evil with kindness. Now that happens for everybody. But let me remind you, this is not... Paul is not saying that it's easy to, you can do this to your enemies. You can't. And uh, this is, there's that, there's those uh, Greek words about love. This is the one you don't like. And it only occurs here and about two other places in referring to you and your brethren. And one of them is 2 Peter, the first chapter. Yes, sir? I don't hate the person. I hate the sin in their life. But I'm not talking about the sinner out there. I'm talking about you, James. Are you my friend? Have we developed a relationship of friendship? I think we have. I hope all of us are developing that relationship. Because we're not. this is not God so loved the world. This is the word of not that's used in, in, in the New Testament over and over and over because God's love for us is unconditional, self-sacrificing, and we've got to have that love for one another. But in that conversation between Jesus and Peter, Jesus asks Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me like I love the world? And he says, I phileo you. I have, we are friends. We have a relationship. I love you like a wife or a husband or a close friend. I have that friendship for you like Jonathan and David had. We're not talking about anything untoward here or ugly here. But the friendship love and the romantic love use the word phileo. And we want to say to ourselves, I don't have to do that. John Orr is able to say about Chris, Chris's jokes are corny, Right? Somebody's going to say it about my jokes. We give you a bad time about your jokes. But we love John because of his jokes. And we get to enjoy these things about people. And we're starting with agape for everybody. But listen to your Christian graces. Philipp, uh, for 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Because you've been saved, essentially. You've, you've escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. Verse 4. For this reason, giving all diligence, so work hard first. Add to your faith salvation. Your belief in God. Add to that virtue, general goodness. Be working at being the kind of person God wants you to. And to your virtue, that decision to be right, which starts with the repentance. Start learning what right is. Add to your virtue knowledge. And as you get more and more knowledge, you're going to have to break some habits. Add to your knowledge, self-control. 
And as you get self-control and you start overcoming these bad habits, add to your self-control perseverance. You've got to endure and keep on doing the right thing as much as possible. To perseverance, don't just live a life that is morally correct and, and not immoral, but be like God, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness, the leo. And to brotherly kindness, agape. We're not ready to love the world till I love my brother. How, how can I love God whom I've not seen? John asks us if I don't love God. How can I love God who I've not seen if I can't love my brother who I have seen? We're lying when we say that. And so Paul here, don't let your zeal subside, but don't start using the excuse of they're unpleasant, they're difficult, and I don't have to like them. Yeah, you do. You do. Just like you have to like your mom, you have to like your dad, you have to like your family members, you've got to like your wife and your husband, even when they're annoying when I tell too many personal illustrations or too many historical in illustrations, let me know. But you got to like me anyway. Yes. Good point. As our uh, uh, that uh, Dana was telling us that uh, people in big families may understand this well. We are end up being closer to some parts of our family than others, but we love them all. They are all our family. We're looking for that family love for one another as well. Storge is something that never is commanded by itself, but there's compound words using the word storge for it, and we are supposed to have familial love for one another, and yeah, my brother wants to go fishing with me. We'll climb over rocks together, and we're close, but I love my sister and my other sisters, both of them, and we could get a little closer to one another sometimes, but I'm trying to build that relationship and closeness with every Christian I can, because every Christian, we need these relationships. We need someone who loves us in Christ. Don't we? Because sometimes our literal family is not going to be supportive that way. We need these relationships. It's so important to meet the visitor, let them know your name, get it, take them to lunch, call them later, be, get exchange information with them. Yes, Joe. Every one of these gifts. After this list comes, get with it. Let's have some zeal about this. You've got to do all of this with zeal, not half-heartedly. What did God think about the Laodiceans? What was their problem? They were lukewarm. They were as tepid and nasty as their water. And had they been hot or cold, Jesus would have been able to deal with that, but he's going to vomit them out of his mouth, for Revelation chapter 3 literally says, because they are lukewarm. God doesn't accept the lukewarm. Did Jesus let the fellow go back home and bury his father when he said, I want to follow you, but first let me go bury my father? What did Jesus have to say about that? Let the dead bury the dead. Is salt that loses its salt, its savor, its saltiness good for anything? Luke 14, in 
ends with that, that uh, we talked about counting the cost. But after Jesus reminded us to count the cost, he reminded us that salt that isn't salty is good for nothing. It's not good for the field, and it ruins the manure pile. To be just a little bit crude to a second grade, to a two-year-old, we're not as good as poop whenever we don't have fire for God. We've got to do all this with zeal. Don't give me all my soapbox, Joe. Yeah, oh man. What hatred was committed? We just asked all those questions. Continue. I want, yeah. Is zeal and fervor a matter of choice and will? Yes. Good point. We are all different. We've got to understand why people are different and look at the world through their point of view and quit expecting them to do what I want them to do all of the time. Isn't this passage about the differing gifts yeah. that we have according to our faith? Amen. Now, there's more we can say about this, but I want to, I want to get back to the zeal idea. Is zeal a choice or not? Can you command something that's not a choice? <clears throat> Grow four inches. Take me to enough buffets and I can do that. But I will not get four inches taller. It's not going to happen. Shrink six inches. I wouldn't enjoy that, but maybe I could work that out with enough dieting. But I can't get shorter. Jesus reminded us we can't, by worrying, add a span. We can't add anything to our stature. We can't get any taller, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. It, that's not going to happen. But we can keep our zeal burning. How? Start with a mental decision. I'm going to be zealous for God. I am going to do what he wants me to do. Because sometimes our willer has to get ahead of our wanter. We have to will to do something and once you start doing the right thing, you're going to catch up with that desire. Much like a baby crying at 3 a.m., you're not going to want to get up and change that baby and feed that baby. But once you've done so, and that baby's going, ooh, and maybe even saying the amazing words, Papa, let me tell you what, it's awesome. We grandparents know all about that. We've got we've to keep the zeal fire burning. Don't forget, talking, opening your mouth, and having the conversations. You will find some discouragement when somebody is not receptive. But there is nothing more zeal burning than to work with new converts, to work with sinners who are interested, to find good soil. And that good soil, just, you find that one that puts out 30, 50, that hundredfold individual just keeps you going for years. Amen, John? You just really got to talk to people about the Lord and share with them. Bring them with you to church, to small groups. Have the conversation, whether it's at Walmart or any place else. We've got to go ahead and get somebody with you if you don't feel comfortable studying with them yourself. But talk to those friends, acquaintances. And don't get discouraged whenever family, if family members are the only ones we, ones we talk to, we're probably going to get a little discouraged. Let's get it out there to everybody we can. Um, verse 13. Amen. We're in chapter 12 and verse 13. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction. Persistent in prayer. Share with the saints who are in need. Practice hospitality. Three keys to positive Christianity are right here in verse 12. Three keys to positive Christianity in verse 12. What are they? 
Rejoice, persevere, and pray. Prayer, patience, joy. Maybe we should say hope, patience, and prayer. Maybe it's six items. I don't know. Next question. How do those three things work together? Start with your hope and rejoice in what God's done for you and where you're going. And as you encounter persecution, as you encounter illness, as you encounter financial setbacks, as problems come because the devil's going to bring those problems, get, be patient. Remember your joy. Remember your hope. And all the way through it, you better keep praying. Amen? you got to keep praying. Verse 13. Why does verse 13 say this twice? Is he saying something different? Uh, let me suggest to you that he's saying the same thing twice. Share with the saints who are in need. Practice hospitality. What did the traveling missionaries of the first century, how did they go from place to place? How did Paul sustain himself in Philippi after he baptized Lydia? She said, get in my house. You're going to stay in my house. You're going to work for my house. Hospitality. And the brethren in need, quite often, hospitality is, is being generous with others. Literally, it means stranger lover. It's a compound word. Which has to do with, uh, you remember uh, uh, Zeno from the uh, uh, My Big Fat Greek Wedding? That word is still in use. And we still talk about xenophobia. He says, I have my wife, my daughter is marrying a xeno, a foreigner, a stranger, not a Greek. Love the not a Greeks. Practice hospitality. About verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but enjoy the company of the lowly. Do not be conceited. Which is easier to control, what you say or what you think? What you say is a lot easier to control. Is it? Maybe. You've got to control what you think first. Yes. Thanks. I think if you'll control what you think and put a kibosh on all that negative thinking, you're not going to have trouble with your tongue. You can bite your tongue. You can bite your tongue, but out of the abundance of the heart, what does the mouth do? It speaks. What did Freud say, although I don't like a lot of what he did? What did Freud have to say about those, those slips of the tongue? Why do we call them Freudian slips? Because we accidentally say exactly what we mean. The abundance of the heart pops out. I think we've got to be careful on, on both, both ends. What makes it difficult to rejoice and to weep with other people? If, you find, if we find that difficult, why? Do you find it hard to cry with somebody who's crying? Do you find it difficult to rejoice? Why would we find it difficult to rejoice with someone or weep with someone? Personal experience. When we're in personal experience, it's going to be really hard when I don't care about you. If I don't love you. If I don't. Rejoicing and weeping. We've got to learn that empathy of putting ourselves in the other person's shoes. Just like you're talking about. Exactly, Willa. We've got to be able to feel with others. Not just feel our own emotions and selfishness. Selfish people can't do this. But we've got to do it. We've got to do it. Can you sing in harmony without listening? I don't know about you, but I've got to have the pitch. 
I've got to have the key. I've got to hear what you're saying in order for me to harmonize with you. And I've got to listen. You can't be in harmony with someone else unless you're listening to them. Is it difficult to be around conceited people? How do you enjoy the, the company of the, of the proud? Enjoy the company of the lowly. And stop thinking you're better than they are. And Philippians chapter 2 tells us to look at everyone as better than ourselves. Not that I'm not good. Not that I'm not worthy of God's love. But God loves me. And I'm... You're a soul going to heaven or hell right now. And you, if you're in trouble and you need to cry or you need to rejoice, then you're more important right there. Think about that way. I'm important. You're just a little more important than I am, at least in that moment. I think those are good questions. And I can't imagine going on with five minutes left to talk about what Chris was mentioning just a moment ago. How do I deal with the enemy? This is, is great for Christians. But sometimes even Christians make themselves my enemy. And certainly the devil is my enemy. How am I going to deal with him? And Paul is going to quote Old Testament and remind us of how much further we've, we've, we need to go than that. But I do have a little song for you. You going to share with me? Oh, I have a couple of couple of think about it questions. What? Have you got a Popeil pocket fisherman in your spiritual bag? Have you got a salad master that my mother would pull out once a year when we made coleslaw? We did not eat cabbage at my house. And maybe on the biggest day of the year we might have coleslaw and mom would remember, she knew where the, none of us knew where the salad master is. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. But the Salad Master giant aluminum thing with wheels on it that you would, she could grind up her coleslaw in 10 seconds flat, but it took her an hour to find the thing and put, set it all up and get it all out there. But it was a labor-saving device. Yeah, now I just buy my coleslaw in a bag. And I, I, I let someone else use the Salad Master. But is my gift like the Salad Master? Left in the, left in the, covered away somewhere just in case I might be needed that one time. How do I love somebody who's hard to love? How do you love Brother Graham? He's hard to handle. He repeats Brother Orr's jokes now and then. I Sometimes he might pick his nose in front of me. You know, his toes are about that long. And literally, I have toes that are as long as my little finger. It's real scary. I don't wear flip-flops. You know, but I mean, there's things about each one of us that can be difficult for someone else. How do I love the hard to love? How do you deal with a member of your family who's hard to love? The more I know them, the more I can see where they're at in their life. And I can know where they can be if only somebody will love them and share with them. And maybe I can be that person. What does God, how does God want, what does God want for that person? How can I be that bridge for them? How can I be of help to them? Some people are very difficult to love. But Glenda is figuring out exactly how to do this. Next week. We'll talk about the life that is not, not conflict-free. Our lives are not conflict-free. So look forward to answering that question for me next week. But in the meantime, Paul is saying it's all about our heart. 
and what we do. <laughs> and what we do has got to start in the heart. And God's given us something. Let's use it. But I need to ask God this question, and you can sing it with me if you will. Turn my heart, O oh God, like rivers of water. Turn my heart, O oh God, by your hand, till my whole life flows in the river of your spirit, and my name brings honor to the Lamb. Lord, I surrender to your word. Next week, we'll start just where we left off, and I think it'll be worth spending a week on do not repay anyone evil for evil. How do I deal with those who are insisting upon giving, doing evil to me in my life? So, so that means we'll start in verse 17. Verse 17 of chapter 12 of Romans. 12, 17. 1217, do not repeat anyone evil for evil. Yes, starting in verse 17 next week. Thank you, John.